Welcome once again to Jesus or Muhammad. We are continuing our series on one of the most popular Muslim apologists in history, Dr. Zakir Naik. Now, Muslims like to believe that Zakir Naik has refuted Christianity's top defenders. And in fact, I have never seen or heard of Zakir Naik facing an experienced Christian debater on stage. It's never happened. Have you, have you heard of it, Sam? Never. Okay, never so, it, and yet he has this reputation, right? Uh, Muslims look at him as this champion debater. Invincible. No one can refute him. His knowledge of the Bible and the Quran is uh, second to none and cannot be refuted. That's the impression he gives. And it, it's, it's, really, it's really a brilliant strategy, I must say, right? Uh, if you have, a, let's say, a Muslim in India, where Zakir Naik does a lot of his presentations. If Zakir Naik faces a local evangelist on stage in a debate, the, lo the, the local Muslim population, they don't know the difference between that local pastor and, say, Sam Shamoon, right? Precisely. They think, oh, here's a defender of Christianity, and Zakir Naik is, is, uh, is really giving hard arguments against this guy, not realizing we're over here, we're over here practically begging Zakir Naik for the opportunity to refute his claims on stage, but he's, he's smart enough to realize these arguments would not stand up to scrutiny. Exactly. These arguments would be smashed on stage, right? Yeah, precisely. I mean, look at our top Christian apologists. The best Christian apologists and debaters we have do not shun the toughest opposition, the best the other side has to offer. Look at William Lane Craig or James White. They take the best the other side has to offer because they are confident they have the truth, and the truth is easily defended if you know it, <clears throat> and believe it from your heart. So unlike uh, Zachar Nayak, our top guys are willing to take the best the other side has to offer. And, and can we go ahead and say this? We didn't talk about this beforehand or anything, but, but can, we, can we say this in public for everyone here? Yeah. We, you and I, yeah. will take on all of Islam's top apologists <laughs> at the same time, yeah, on definitely. the same stage. Yeah, that, right? that, yeah. and so that's if, not if, an exaggeration. We mean it, we'll do it. Line them up, we'll be there by the so grace Muslim, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Muslim, the Holy Spirit if a Muslim contacts us and says, David, I have just talked to Zakir Naik and Shabir Ali and yep. Jamal Badawi and yep. all these other guys, and they have all agreed to sit on one side of the stage, and you two will sit on the other side of the stage, and we'll have, we will debate a, a bunch of topics that are essential to, to Christianity and Islam. Definitely, and we're not just saying it here. We're going on the record. We're, we're putting our reputations on the line, and our reputation does, doesn't matter. It's the reputation of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we will be willing and ready to meet all your top apologists because we know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have the truth, and the truth is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord, not in Islam. So let's do it. So we're here. Is it going to happen? Yeah. No. Is it ever going to happen? No. Yeah. Um, so tonight we're going to be discussing a very important topic that, that you might not, people who aren't familiar with Islamic apologetics might not realize just how important this topic is. Muhammad in the Bible. Zakir Naik and other Muslim apologists claim that you find predictions about Muhammad in the scriptures of the Christians and the Jews, yeah. Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, Sam, yeah. is this just an extra line of evidence for them, or is, or is this something absolutely essential to what they believe? Well, it is absolutely essential. It's not just an extra line of evidence. <clears throat> it, it's that too, but it's more than that, because the Quran, at least two passages, asserts Chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran. Chapter 7, verse 157. And then chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran. 61, verse 6. Those passages assert that the previous prophets and their previous scriptures announced the coming of Muhammad. For example, in chapter 7, verse 157, we are told that there are prophecies of an unlettered prophet, Ummi. Now, we don't have time to delve into what that term actually means. But classically, Muslims have understood the term Ummi to mean that this prophet would be illiterate, can't read or write. They'll find predictions of an illiterate prophet to come in the Torah and the gospel which the Jews and Christians possessed at the time of Muhammad. 61.6, uh, Muhammad puts on the mouth of Jesus, our Lord, our blessed Lord and Savior, a prophecy of the coming of Ahmed. Jesus comes to the children of Israel and says, O children of Israel, I'm a messenger from your Lord <clears throat> coming to confirm the Torah between my hands and to give you good news of a messenger to come after me whose name is Ahmed. So it's not just an extra line of evidence, it's necessary and vitally important that Muslims are able to demonstrate from our scriptures that there are prophecies pointing to Muhammad. In other words, Muhammad says that there are clear prophecies about him in these scriptures. Yep. If we open them and we don't find 
clear prophecies about Muhammad, it actually means he's a false prophet. And it means it's the not, Quran is false, yeah. yeah it's not just one, one particular Muslim argument has failed, but they have lots of others. Exactly, yeah. It's Muhammad would be a false prophet. If they're the not Quran would be a fraud. It cannot be from, uh, come from an all-knowing God, and obviously Muhammad would then therefore be a false prophet because Muhammad says his standing miracle is the Quran. Well, if standing miracle contains errors, lies, deceptions, and distortions, then that is the greatest testimony that he is a false prophet. Yep. All right, now... What are we dealing with? We're dealing with an argument that is absolutely essential to Islam. Islam stands or falls with this argument. And we are going to one of Islam's most popular apologists of all time to see what has he come up with. In other words, Muslims yeah. have had 14 centuries to sift through our scriptures and to find all these clear prophecies about Muhammad. Zakir Naik is on stage. He's addressing this issue, and he's going to give his four best. He's going to give his yep. four best Top arguments ones, yeah. from our scriptures that we do have clear prophecies about Muhammad in the Bible. So, shall we take a look sure. at some of these? By the way, before you go on, I, I noticed you said one of the most popular, not one of the best, and I like that distinction. Yeah, well, I, and, and, you know, it, I think this is important. The, the people who tend to become the most popular Muslim apologists are people who can generally spout total nonsense and just sound good while they're <laughs> saying it, right? And Zakir, Zakir uh, Naik, uh, I, I'm not impressed with his speaking ability. I'm, not I'm certainly not impressed with his knowledge of either Christianity or Islam. Yeah. What's impressive, and it, this impresses me as well, is Zakir Naik's ability to cite a bunch of verses very fast. You can do that. Uh, he, <clears throat> recite a bunch of verses very quickly, pack a lot of information into, uh, into a, you know, a, a short amount of time. And he's good at this. And this is what his popularity is based on. What happens, though, is we start unpacking, oh, we yeah. start unpacking what he has packed into a little tight argument, and we, look, we take a closer look, and what happens? What happens? Well, the claims start to fall apart. All right, well, let's look at one of the two most common uh, Muslim claims about, pro about a prophecy about Muhammad in the Bible. This is Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, and let's look at the first clip of Dr. Knight. If you read the Old Testament... It is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. It says, I shall raise thee up a prophet. Almighty God is speaking in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. And he says, I shall raise thee up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee. And I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. All right, Dr. Nike has read Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 for us. Yep. So this is a this is a, a very interesting passage. Let me read the verse to you again. I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen. That's countrymen in uh, New American Standard Bible. Some say uh, some translations say brethren. Uh, <clears throat> I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. So talking to Moses, like you, the prophet's going to be like Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So, Sam, yes. that's what the verse says. But Zakir Naik, whenever we quote the Quran, is very, very quick to say, hey, you have to read this in context. Would someone reading this passage in the context, in the immediate context of Deuteronomy um, 18, in the larger context yes. of Deuteronomy as a whole, in the even larger context of the Bible as a whole, would anyone in a million years ever get the impression that this is talking about some Arab prophet? Definitely not. If they're going to handle the text correctly and read the passage in its immediate and overall context, the only valid interpretation, the only accurate interpretation understanding of the passage is that here God is promising an office of prophets, an office of prophethood, a prophetic office in which God will raise up prophets to speak on his behalf to the people. And how do I know that? Well, if you actually start the prophecy at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15, all the way to 19, then you'll see what Moses is getting at, what God is telling the Israelites through Moses. In fact, for the sake of time, let me just read verse 16. <clears throat> just as you desired of Yahweh your God. See, Moses is talking to the nation of Israel saying, Just as you desired of Yahweh your God at Horeb on the day of assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God, or see this great fire any more lest I die. <clears throat> what is he, God's response? And Yahweh said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from their brothers. Do you see the context? The context is quite clear. The Israelites have just seen God appear in a cloud. They see thunder and lightning, <clears throat> and, and they hear God's voice, 
And they're struck with terror and fear. And by the way, if you want to find the reference to that, it's Exodus chapter 20. You read Exodus chapter 20, and you pick it up from verses 18 and read to 23. You'll see that they were struck with terror, hearing the voice of God and seeing the cloud descend upon Mount Sinai. So they told Moses, we don't want to hear God's voice lest we die. You speak to us on God's behalf. So God says, what you requested is a good thing. From now on, I'm going to raise up prophets to speak to you on my behalf. Are you telling me that God was going to wait for 2,200 years to send an air prophet to talk to Israelites? Well, what did God do for that 2,200-year period of time? Just left them in the dark? But hold on. You, as a Christian, would believe that Jesus was the exactly. ultimate fulfillment of this he's passage, the, Because right? he's the yeah. ultimate fulfillment of all these promises and prophecies made to Israel. But hold, is, but hold on. That, that's a 1,400-year period. You just... You just no, because what I'm saying is that this is an office, a prophetic office, that's uh, filled by many people subsequent or pr uh, prior to Jesus. Jesus comes and consummates this office, but he's not the only one. It's a succession of prophets, starting with Moses and then being fulfilled in its ultimate sense in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So no, there's no problem with my position. <clears throat> now, before, before we uh, thoroughly expose uh, Zachary Knight's argument here, I wanted to, to play one more clip on this argument by Dr. Nike, where he gives the Christian view for us, right? Yeah. He gives the Christian view. And you have to watch Zachary Nike because he's very quick to say, this is what Christians believe, and this is the Christian argument, when I've never heard a Christian say this yeah. sort of thing, right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and play the next clip. Why, according to Dr. Zachary Nike, do Christians believe that this applies to Jesus? Let, let, let's hear Zachary Nike's version of our argument. The Christians, on the other hand, they say, that this prophet mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy refers to Jesus, peace be upon him. And when we ask them that why does this prophecy refer to Jesus, peace be upon him, they tell us that the prophecy mentions the prophet to come will be from the brethren of Moses, peace be upon him, and that prophet will be like Moses, peace be upon him. And the criteria they give for the fulfillment of this prophecy is, they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Jew. And like prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he was too a prophet of Almighty God. <laughs> now, Sam, <laughs> Sam, so, yeah. when, 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 when we want to show that this applies to Jesus, that the, the ultimate fulfillment of yes. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is Jesus, is our argument now, or has it ever been, or will it ever be, one, Jesus was a Jew, and two, Jesus was a prophet, so clearly he's the he's fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. In fact, that's such a powerful argument. I've never heard that before, but now I am convinced Jesus is the prophet like Moses. <laughs> Obviously not. That's actually nonsense, mm -hmm. and it's a blatant distortion mm -hmm. of what the actual Christian position and, is. And, and we have to ask ourselves, Dr. Knight claims that he is a, a student of various religions, yeah. right? He claims to be an expert on Christianity. Any expert on Christianity, anyone who's been studying Christianity for a, a couple of months would understand what our position is. Yet Zakir Naik, when he's speaking to an audience full of Muslims, deliberately distorts our argument, waters it down. Why? Why wouldn't he present our argument accurately and then respond to what we actually say? We can only assume it's because he knows people in the audience wouldn't actually believe his claims. They wouldn't believe his response. They wouldn't believe his argument anymore if they knew what we actually say. And we're not going to go into much detail. Let me give you a very, uh, I'll, I'll read two passages briefly, and then Sam can add some additional responses to this argument. And then we'll, then we'll see that the actual context rules out Muhammad as a, as a prophet at all. He can't possibly be a prophet. And we'll even see that according to Deuteronomy 18, Moses would have had Muhammad killed for the things Muhammad said. But let me read a passage in the book of Acts. Why is this important? Because according to Islam, Jesus had followers who were good Muslims and who converted to the teachings of Jesus and then went out and proclaimed his message. Well, we have records. We have records of the teachings of Jesus' followers. One of these passages is in the book of Acts, chapter 3. I'll begin at verse 19. This is Peter. This is the apostle Peter talking. He says, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the, uh, until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, 
the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet, that prophet, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Does this sound familiar? This is the Apostle Peter, Jesus' follower, quoting Deuteronomy 18, applying it to Jesus in the presence of a bunch of people who would know what that passage means, unlike Muhammad's followers who would have had no clue what the passage means. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So the apostle Peter here, Jesus' follower, says this applies to Jesus. And this is a Jew speaking to a bunch of Jews on exactly what this passage means. They would have had some idea. So this is very different from Muhammad speaking to a bunch of Arabs who have no clue what this passage means. He can get away with it. Peter wouldn't have gotten away with it because, because the people would have refuted him. Exactly. But there's uh, one more passage I want to read from the book of Deuteronomy itself because we, we, we watched two short clips. Zachar Naik actually goes on to show various ways that Muhammad is like Moses. So for instance, uh, Muhammad was a political leader just as Moses was a political leader and so on. So he gives examples like these. But... In context, Zachary love, loves context, in context to the people of the time, what did it mean to refer to a prophet like Moses? What was important exactly. to them? Well, let's read. The end of the book of Deuteronomy, the book Zachary is quoting to show us that like Moses means something like Muhammad. This is Deuteronomy, final chapter, beginning at verse 9. Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. So we, we're getting an idea of what like Moses meant in the context of the time. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants and all his land, and for all the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So you have the two criteria of being like Moses, knowing God face to face, in other words, having such a high relationship with God, and miraculous works performed in the sight of the people. Sam, do, yeah. do those, do, does that refer to Muhammad? Does that uh, sound like Muhammad? Definitely not. Now notice what the, uh, what the criteria ha uh, happen to be. <clears throat> he has to know God intimately face to face and has to perform miracles like Moses did. Well, the Quran itself testifies that Muhammad's God is not the God of Moses and Muhammad was incapable of doing miracles like Moses did. For instance, if you go to chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, this is what Muhammad says to the Jews and Christians who claim to be children of God. Chapter 5, verse 18. <clears throat> the Jews and Christians say, we are sons of Allah and his beloved. We are the children of God. We are his beloved. Say, why then does he chastise you for his sins? No, you are but mortals of his creating. So Muhammad says to the Jews and Christians, neither of you are children of God, children of Allah, the God that Muhammad preached, because Muhammad's God is a father to no one. He has no children, whether spiritually or <clears throat> biologically. And as Christians, we condemn the belief, the notion, that God sires children sexually. That's a blasphemy to us, just as much as, as it is a blasphemy to Muslims. We believe that God is a spiritual father who begets spiritually. His children are his because they're born of his spirit. However, Muhammad says, no, you're not his children. Yet in the same book of Deuteronomy, same book of Deuteronomy that Zechariah quotes, several times Moses affirms that Israel, the nation of Israel, are the sons and daughters of the living God. For example, Deuteronomy 14.1. This is what God is saying through Moses to say to the nation. Deuteronomy 14.1. You are the sons of the Lord your God. <clears throat> you shall not cut yourselves or make any uh, baldness on your foreheads for the dead. You are the sons of the living God. Muhammad said, no, you're not. Deuteronomy 32.6. Do you thus repay Yahweh, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you? Who made you and established you? Deuteronomy 32.6, Yahweh is their father. They are children of the living God. 
And Deuteronomy 32.18 says that Yahweh begot Israel, begot them, gave birth to them, spiritually speaking. But Muhammad says his God is a father to no one, let alone the father of the Jews. How then can Muhammad be a prophet like Moses when his theology contradicts the theology of Moses? And then finally, did Muhammad do miracles like Moses? The Quran itself says, answers with an emphatic no. Chapter 28, verse 48 of the Quran says this. Chapter 28, 48 says, say, <clears throat> not say, but the disbelievers are asking Muhammad, why is a sign not sent with them like it was sent with Moses aforetime? So here, the people are saying, Muhammad, how come we don't see any miraculous signs accompanying you the way it accompanied Moses? Moses did signs. How come we don't see you doing any signs like Moses? That's chapter 28, verse 48. And Muhammad doesn't say, well, here's a sign like Moses. He simply says, well, miracles are in the power of Allah, and Allah hasn't been pleased to give me a miracle other than the Quran. So on the basis of the criteria given in Deuteronomy 32, uh, 34, 10 to 12, Knowing God intimately and doing miracles, Muhammad fails both counts. His God is not the same God that Moses knew intimately, and he could not do miracles like Moses did. However, the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly fulfills that criteria. So there's no way, really, this passage could be talking about Muhammad. But there's even more we can point out showing that not only, not only is Muhammad not the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, not only... Is he not preaching the same theology, the same God that Moses preached? We can also show that according to Deuteronomy 18, Muhammad can't possibly be a prophet of any kind except for a false prophet. The passage that Muslims quote, if they'd finish reading it, actually shows that Muhammad can't be a prophet at all. And let's read the verse. So Deuteronomy 18, 18. Uh, just two verses later, we read Deuteronomy 18.20, which gives two criteria of a false prophet. And we have the two criteria right here. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. This is the same passage. This is the same passage that Muslims are quoting to show that... Muhammad is a prophet, and just two verses later, after Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, we read that Muhammad can't be a prophet at all. Why? Two criteria. If you speak something, if you deliver a revelation that doesn't come from God, or if you speak in the name of other gods, you're a false prophet, and Moses, according to Moses, you would be put to death. Exactly. Right? Yep. Now, did Muhammad do these? Did Muhammad do either one of these? Yeah, definitely. Of in fact, he did. he did both, and we know. This is exactly what Muhammad did with the infamous satanic verses. If you don't know the story, I have 37 Muslim sources of, various, of varying degrees of reliability, including passages that go all the way back to people like Ibn Abbas, saying that Muhammad delivered a revelation to his followers. They bowed down in honor of that. Muhammad bowed down in honor, honor of the revelation. Then Muhammad comes back later and says, the devil made me do it. The revelation said that you can actually pray to three goddesses, Alat, Alusa, and Manat. These were three pagan deities of the Quraysh tribe, Muhammad's tribe. Muhammad said you can pray to them because they can take your prayers to Allah. Muhammad delivers this revelation as part of the Quran to his followers. He comes back later and says, the devil tricked me. And he said, and I'll quote it to you, in at tabari when he was embarrassed about this, he said, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. That's at tabari volume 6, page 111. Think about this. I have fabricated, this is Muhammad speaking, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. What does is, what is Deuteronomy 18.20 says? If you speak in the name of God and it doesn't come from God, you're a false prophet, you have to die. And if you speak in the names of other gods, which Muhammad did when he said you can pray to Allah, Alusa, and Manat, right. you're a false prophet, you have to die. So Muslims say, aha, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, 18, this shows that Muhammad is a prophet. And we believe in Moses too. Muslims, get this through your minds. If Muhammad had delivered the satanic verses during the time of Moses, Moses would have said, everyone pick up a stone because this guy has to die. He is a false prophet. Exactly. But Muhammad wasn't stoned to death. Why? Because he delivered his revelations around a bunch of Arab Bedouins and so on who didn't know the difference, who didn't know. And that's the only reason he was able to be successful. So 
According to Deuteronomy 18, Muhammad can't be, a, can't be a prophet at all. He would have actually been killed as a false prophet, and yet Muslims put this forward as <clears throat> clear proof that Muhammad is a prophet. And just one final point, just to reiterate that the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. Don't forget that in Acts chapter 3, which you read, when Peter appeals to Deuteronomy 18, <clears throat> and then points to the Lord Jesus Christ as the ultimate fulfillment of that promise, earlier in that same chapter, Peter and John go ahead and perform a miracle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 3, there is a person who's paralyzed, a beggar, who's a, who's a paralytic, who is healed miraculously in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he instantly walked, miraculously walked, as a sign that Jesus Christ is the one appointed by God. Because remember what the criteria stated. One of the criteria was that the prophet like Moses has to do miracles like Moses. Here Peter is performing a supernatural work in the sovereign name of the Lord Jesus Christ as proof that Jesus and Jesus alone is the ultimate fulfillment of all the blessings and promises that God gave to Israel. It has nothing to do with Muhammad. In fact, an accurate reading of the Old Testament and the New Testament condemns Muhammad as a false prophet. <clears throat> all right, so we're going to look at uh, one more very quickly. Um, we'll look at uh, one more clip by Zucker Nike, and this will only take a second for you. I don't want to spend much time on this because it's so horrible. Uh, let's play this next clip. This will only take a second to refute. So let's see Z one of Zucker Nike's four best arguments on Muhammad in the Bible. First, let's mention the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. The book will be given to thee, and it will be said to him, Pray, read this, but I will say, I am not learned. This is exactly what happened when the first revelation was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And when Archangel Gabriel revealed the first word from Surah Ikra or Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number 1, and he said, Ikra, read. The beloved Prophet said, Ma anabikari, I am not learned. This is exactly the fulfillment of the prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Chapter number 29, verse number 12. All right. So this, this one is actually so bad. Uh, let's just yeah. refute it and move on to, to some that, that require a bit more explanation. Think, yeah. All this requires is the ability to read surrounding verses, to not actually rip one totally out of context. And if you see, if you see what this verse actually says in context, That's right. uh, one, you Muslims should be ashamed that your pol apologists ever dare to quote this and apply it to Muhammad. Uh, and two, I have to say, if you want to apply this to Muhammad, we say, great, exactly. If this is talking about Muhammad, we say, amen. We would love this to apply to Muhammad. Why? Exactly, because yeah. this isn't talking about a prophet to come. Let me read this verse, and let me read the verse so you can see the argument. Uh, so do, um, Isaiah 29, 12. Then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, please read this. And he will say, I cannot read. Wait a minute, Muhammad was illiterate. Yeah, he was told to right. recite revelations. He couldn't do it. You see here, clear prophecy of a prophet who was to come. Yeah. What happens when we actually read a verse in context? What happened here, Sam? Well, actually, if you read just the entire chapter itself, you'll see that this is judgment against the nation of Israel. God says that he's going to take away <clears throat> their ability to discern the message because of their persistent rebellion and disbelief. In fact, real quickly, let me just look at verses 9 to 11. And you tell me whether this fits Muhammad. Verses 9 to 11, astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. He's talking to the nation. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For Yahweh has poured out upon you, the nation, a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes and covered your heads. Close your eyes and cover your heads. And the vision of all this has become to you. Who's he talking to? To the nation, to you, Israel, this vision that Isaiah is receiving about you and the judgment that will fall upon you, this vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men g give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. So the context is talking about judgment. Mm -hmm. Israel refuses to submit to the warnings and the judgment that God's true prophets bring to her. Therefore, God says, I'm now at the point that that little illumination you had, I'm going to take it away. So that your example is like the example of a person who can read and is given a sealed book, can't read it, it's sealed, or someone who's given a book but is illiterate. That's likening Israel to someone who's illiterate or to someone who's incapable of reading a book because it's sealed. 
How in the world do you extrapolate from this that this is Muhammad? I don't know, but and, clearly and this, it's not. This is, this is condemning people who say that, right? Precisely. It's people who are making excuses saying, I, I, I can't read this, right? They don't want to hear it. Right? Oh, yeah. So, so you hand it to someone, he says, oh, I can't even open this. You hand it to someone else, he says, oh, I can't even read it. It's people who are making excuses and refusing to submit to God's message, right? So if, so that's if you're Muhammad, saying this is Muhammad, then Ma you're saying Muhammad is a stubborn rebel against God. And that's precisely. why we say if you want to And that's that judgment God, upon yeah. him. He's illiterate because that's God, the sign of God's judgment. And finally, if that's speaking of a literate prophet, well, then verse 11 must be speaking of another prophet mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. Why take verse 12 and assume that, see, here's a prophecy of an illiterate prophet, but mm -hmm. ignore verse 11? Because 11 says a book will be given to someone who can read, but it will be sealed. So Muslims... That prophet hasn't shown up. That means now you have to wait another prophet after Muhammad who'll be given a sealed book and will say, hey, I can't read it. It's sealed. Mm -hmm. So much for Muhammad being the seal of prophets. Let's, let's go. We, we read the, verse, the verses that come before it, but context also involves the verses that come after it. Let's read one more verse. And you tell me why this is important. Yeah. Verse 13, the very next verse after this passage, continuing this theme of condemning people for refusing to listen to God's warnings and message. Then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of traditional learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Why, why is this important? Why would this be important? Well, number one, it's talking about, again, the judgment that will fall upon the nation. But number two, Jesus actually quotes Isaiah 29, 13 to condemn to, the to Jews. To praise people and say there's another no, prophet coming? No, to condemn the Jews for nullifying the word of God because of their traditions. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. He says, Isaiah spoke right about you hypocrites mm -hmm. when he said, and he quotes Isaiah 29, 13 to, to prove beyond any doubt, this is a passage about condemnation. Because the Jews, instead of submitting to the word of God, nullified because of their traditions. Therefore, if this is about Muhammad, that's even stronger proof that the Quran nullifies the word of God. The Quran is not revelation from God. So, Zakir Naik noticed the pattern. Zakir Naik, desperate to find biblical confirmation of Muhammad, because Muhammad said it's there, pulls a verse out of context says this is talking about Muhammad. We say, fine, if you want to say that's talking about yep. Muhammad, read it in context. This is not talking about some illiterate prophet. This is talking about someone who uses his illiteracy to reject God's message and reject God's warning. That's what the verses before say. That's what the actual verse says. That's what the verses that come after. And Jesus himself, you regard him as a prophet, Muslims, Jesus himself applies this to people who are in rebellion against God. In the exact same passage. Amen. And you Muslims say, this is Muhammad. We agree. Well, Muhammad if this is, is Muhammad, then Muhammad was rebellious against God, and he is under God's judgment for refusing to listen to God's message. Thank you, Dr. Nike, for proving Wasn't that Muhammad Wasn't he supposed to prove that Muhammad is a true prophet? Why is he helping us expose Muhammad as a false prophet who stands condemned by the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't know, but let's see if he keeps doing that. We'll be back in just a moment here on Jesus or Muhammad. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. We are looking at the claims of Dr. Zakir Naik about Muhammad in the Bible. And we've got a doozy. <laughs> we've got a doozy here. Uh, because as you pointed out, Sam, uh, in the Quran, 61.6, says that we will find him mentioned by name, right? That's right. And so Muslims have been absolutely desperate to find Muhammad mentioned by name. And this one is absolutely hilarious on oh, so yeah. many levels. Um, but let, let, let's just, let's go to the clip and then we'll look at it. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is also mentioned by name in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Solomon, chapter number five, <clears throat> verse number 16. It says in Hebrew, Hikkum amitakim vikulli muhammadim zaydudi wa zairai bayna Jerusalem, which means he's most sweet. His mouth is more sweet. He's altogether lovely. He is my beloved. He is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. They have translated Hikkum Amitakim Vikulli Muhammadim. Now, in the Semitic languages, to give respect, Im is added. Like for God, for Elo, they add Elohim for respect. Similarly to the name of the last and final messenger, Muhammad, they have added Im, so it becomes Muhammadim. But they have translated Muhammadim as altogether lovely. But if you refer to the original text in the Old Testament, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned by name. 
How is this hilarious? <laughs> let, let me count the ways. Yeah. Um, Song of uh, Solomon. Lots of Muslims complain about sexual content in the Bible. Say, therefore, it can't be the word of God. It can't be the word of God if it's talking about sex. This would pose some problems for both the Quran and especially the Hadith if Muslims took it seriously, but Muslims aren't generally consistent with their criticisms. But if you want to say something about sexual content in the Bible, it doesn't get any more sexual than the book Song of Solomon. The entire book is about a loving and sexual relationship between a man and a woman. And they're constantly praising each other for their physical attributes. And the, the, the man's praising the woman for her beauty. She's praising uh, the man for being uh, so just physically fit and just, just uh, an all-around phenomenal man. And so Muslims who complain about all this sexual content in the Bible then go to the most sexual book of the Bible, go right to the middle of it and say, you see, this is talking about Muhammad here. Yeah. And by this the way, one is talking about Muhammad. You do, you do want to make it clear when you say man and woman, it's actually between a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, want, not just, it's not just some partying yeah. teens here. Because we don't want to give Muslims yeah. the impression that the Bible condones fornication. Mm -hmm. The Bible mm -hmm. condemns all forms of sexual immorality, including fornication. This mm -hmm. is a conversation between a husband and wife, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. Solomon and his wife, mm -hmm. and they're romanticizing one another. So, yeah, mm -hmm. of all the books they could choose, this is the one they choose. To and let's out. go, and, and there, there are all kinds of stuff, right? There's all kinds of stuff in here when they're talking about how hot they, they are. But in, in this passage, let's read it. Now, let's start. Remember, context, context. Let's just start at verse 10 so we can see the immediate context of this verse. So chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. This is a woman talking. My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of uh, balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. This guy's got a six pack here. Mm -hmm. His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So, this so is that Jerusalem, verse right? 16, yeah. That verse 16 is the one where Muslims want to say what it actually should be translated as, his mouth is full of sweetness and he is Muhammad. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So after constantly saying, oh, his abdomen and his legs and he's so ripped and he's so awesome, yeah. suddenly it's talking about Muhammad, right? That's the argument. <laughs> yeah, that is the argument. Uh, but notice the context is speaking of someone who's in Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem. So this is a conversation that's taking place between a husband and wife. In fact, if you read just the beginning of the, of the book, the chapter, it's Solomon speaking to his wife and her responding mm -hmm. you know, with intimate words. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is taking place in Jerusalem. Now let's put the geographical location aside. Let us assume it's Muhammad just because the term in Hebrew, Mahmadim. Now notice how he pronounced it, mm -hmm. Muhammadim. Yeah. More accurately it would be it's Mahmadim, yeah. uh, which comes from Mahmad. But let's again assume that because Mahmad sounds like Muhammad, therefore, this clearly is a prophecy of Muhammad. Well, if we're going to use that, that method of interpreting the scripture, you got problems, Muslims, mm -hmm. because this is what I call the phonic fallacy. Mm -hmm. Just because two words from two different languages sound similar, therefore, the conclusion is it must be referring to the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption that Zachar Naik is operating under. Well, if that's the case, then Zachar Naik has, has managed to prove that when Muslims say Allahu Akbar, guess what they're saying, David? Oh, well, that would depend on what Akbar means. In Hebrew, Akbar means mouse. I'm not exaggerating. In fact, let me give you the references where you can see the Hebrew term Akbar. It's Leviticus chapter 11, verse 29. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and verses 11 and 18. In Isaiah 66, 17, there the term mouse or rat is used. And if you go back to the Hebrew, it's Akbar. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if I'm going to employ the methodology used by Zachar Naik and other Muslim Dawagandists, then I must conclude that whenever Muslims say Allahu Akbar, they must be saying Allah is a mouse because Akbar sounds similar to the Hebrew word Akbar, and in Hebrew it means mouse. Yeah. 
So, so just to, if, you, if, you, if you're not clear on this, think about this. If a Christian or a Jew or whoever were to come up to you Muslims after you shout Allahu Akbar yes. and were to say to you, what? How dare you? How dare you call God a mouse? Yes. Your response would be, what are you talking about? We didn't call God a mouse. And suppose he says to you, but Akbar in Hebrew is mouse. Your response would be, I'm not speaking Hebrew, I'm speaking Arabic. Precisely. But what did you just do? You just rejected Zakir Naik's reasoning, right? Here's a word, Mahmud. Oh, it sounds kind of like Muhammad, so we'll just go to this book. <laughs> we'll just go to Saga Solomon. It's all about sex. Go to the verse in the middle of this woman praising this man for his physical attributes and say this verse is talking about Muhammad because it sounds, like, uh, it sounds a little bit like Muhammad. Yeah. Well, guess what? Akbar sounds exactly like, Mus like Muslims pronounce it, right? Yep, it's, uh, exactly. In Hebrew, it sounds exactly like it. So if you accept Zakir Naik's reasoning, you have to accept it when someone says that when you claim, uh, when you say Allah is greater, you're actually saying Allah Precisely. is a mouse. And the only way around it is to reject Zakir Naik's entire methodology, but you don't want to do that because he's your champion. Right? Precisely. He's one of the most popular <laughs> apologists out there. And not only that, another problem is, if he's going to be consistent, he should look for every occurrence of the term Mahbat in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, this, is, this is the word. This is the word that's used exactly. throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. In fact, in Song of Solomon 5.16, it's the plural form of Mahmad. It's Mahmadim. If he really wants to be consistent, he should find the singular form, right? Mm -hmm. Mahmad. Well, lo and behold, we find Mahmad used in several passages. And again, for the sake of time, let me just show you what happens. If I were to employ his method of interpreting the scriptures, which is actually even worse than just I said Jesus. It's pure distortion of scripture. Let me show you what happens. Ezekiel 24, 21. <clears throat> Same word Mahmad is used. Ezekiel 24, 21. Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the Muhammad of your eyes. I'm going to profane Muhammad. So here's the prophecy that God says he's going to profane, humiliate, disgrace, destroy Muhammad. So again, I want to thank Zakir Naik for helping us establish that according to the Bible, Muhammad, a.k.a. Muhammad, is something, someone profane and disgusting to God, and God is going to destroy him. And you can actually do that with a bunch of passages sure. in the Old Testament. We'll go ahead and link to that article, but let, just to recap here, if you Muslims believe in Zakir Naik's reasoning, you've, you haven't proved that Muhammad is a prophet. You prove that Allah is a mouse, and you prove that God, the mouse, will profane and disgrace <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Muhammad. Yeah, this is what happens if you actually take the arguments of your greatest apologists seriously. All right. Well, we wanted to get to the last one, which is uh, uh, certainly, certainly uh, the, the most important for Christians if we're talking about passages from the New Testament that Muslims use to show that the New Testament refers to Muhammad. So let's go ahead and look at this next clip by Dr. Nike on the comforter of John. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I shall ask my father to send you a comforter who shall abide with you forever. Jesus, peace be upon him, repeats the message in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26, where he says, And when the Comforter will come, who I will ask my Father to send, he will testify me. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. I just want to say, I cannot believe he quoted that verse. Is that not yeah. the last verse in this entire passage? Because the, the Muslims are drawing the supposed prophecy about Muhammad from John chapter 14 through John chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 7, is the last verse you Muslims would ever in a million years want to quote if you're trying to show that this comforter is talking about Muhammad. We'll get to that in just a moment, uh, but let's consider the claim in general. Let me go ahead and read uh, chapter 14, verse 16, and uh, I'll go ahead and read 16 to 17. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, so God is the Father, right? Yep. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, helper or comforter, that he may be with you forever. 
That is the spirit of truth. So Jesus, in the verse, identifies the comforter as the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you, Jesus' followers, the people he's talking to, and will be in you. So just some very basic problems here already. I will ask the Father. Is, God, is, God, is Allah the Father no. according to Islam? Definitely not. Nope. And they don't fact, refer to God no, as Father? No. Actually, uh, not only don't refer to him as a father, if you go to chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran, it says that the Jews claim that Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians claim that Jesus, the Messiah, is the son of Allah. And this is a saying of their mouths, and so they imitate the disbelievers of, of, of old, and Allah will fight them for it. Notice, Allah will actually fight, subjugate, humiliate, if not kill, Jews and Christians for claiming that God has a son, specifically in the case of Christians for claiming that Jesus is the son of God. Because according to chapter 19 of the Quran, and I want people who are listening to write these down and read them on their own leisure, um, chapter 19, verses 88 to 93, there it says that the highest relationship a person can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship. Because the very notion of Allah having a son is the height of blasphemy. It is so blasphemous that the entire creation itself shudders with fear at the notion right, that Allah could have a son. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, let's right? keep reading this passage here. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. Who's he talking to here? I saw it to the disciples. Okay, so he will be with you forever. So if, if this is talking about Muhammad, Muhammad was with Jesus' disciples forever, right? Well, but they'll tell you, no, it means his teachings. What, is that what it says? No, it says he himself okay. will abide with you. And, and keep in mind, he's actually trying to comfort them, right? That's exactly. why we're talking about the comforter here. They're sad because they hear Jesus is leaving. Don't worry. God's going to give you another one. He's going to comfort you, and he's going to be with you forever. That's exactly what he says in 14, uh, verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will mm -hmm. come to you. Mm -hmm. He says it right there. Yeah. So don't worry about it. You won't be orphaned. Mm -hmm. The Spirit will come, and the Spirit will then mediate my presence to you, and I'll be with you mm -hmm. through the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. That is the Spirit of Truth. Is Muhammad the Spirit of Truth? If you're asking Zechariah, of course. He, Muhammad is the Spirit of yes. Truth. So, Interesting, that's a title of Angel Gabriel in Islamic theology. Okay, so called, Muhammad yeah. is the Angel Gabriel. Exactly, according, according to, to Muhammad. According Nike, to yeah. So Zakir Naik, keep in mind, has just proven that Muhammad is the Angel Gabriel. <laughs> All right? Yeah. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. So the world did not see Muhammad. Well, they couldn't because he's the Angel Gabriel, right? And exactly. there's obviously so, yeah. some kind of spirit. Yeah. So the world did not see Muhammad because he is the Angel Gabriel. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Again, who's he talking to here? He's talking to the disciples. So what does he say there? That the, the Spirit is already with them mm -hmm. and will be in all of them. So Muhammad, the who is the angel Gabriel, is already with Jesus' followers and is going to be in and them. And dwell them. For what and purpose? So they can to be empower comforted. them. Yes. So they can be comforted by them. And empower them for mission. So basically what we're getting at is, according to Zechariah, not only is Muhammad the angel Gabriel, but Muhammad actually has the essential attributes of deity. He's divine. Why do I say that? Because, again, David, uh, maybe you can help me understand this. In order for this entity to indwell a group of individuals at the same time and be with them wherever they go, in order to comfort them and empower them to accomplish the mission that Christ has entrusted to them, what kind of attributes must this entity have to be in all of these individuals at the same time, wherever they go, to empower and comfort them, guaranteeing the success of their mission. So Muhammad's not just the angel Gabriel, he's God. Because that he presupposes attributes, right? that he's om omniscient, he's om omnipresent, and omnipotent. So Zakir Naik has just proven that Muhammad is Allah in this passage, right? Exactly. If, if, if Muhammad is the one who's going to fulfill this passage. Exactly, right? because he has to be omnipresent, mm -hmm. omniscient, omnipotent, to indwell all of them at the same time, to empower them and comfort them and be with them wherever they go. Therefore, the conclusion is, that Muhammad is Angel Gabriel, and Angel Gabriel is God. That's a conclusion. And that's what we have so far. Any more points we want to, I mean, there, there's, there's a ton of stuff in this Oh, yeah, passage. there's a lot more, in fact, because. Before, before, <laughs> we, before we get to, 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 the, yeah, it's, it's to, to the most devastating one, where we go ahead and grant, yeah. for argument's sake, what Zakir Naik is saying. Yeah. Anything else we want to point out about various ways that Muslims should not be applying this to Oh, to, uh, definitely. To the, the, the one way, uh, well, again, this is going to be the whammy. Uh, but real quickly, let me just explain, for those Christians who want to know, mm -hmm. real quickly, because we're going to show you the whammy. 
where Zechariah's not and Zechariah's argument not only leads to the conclusion that Muhammad is the angel Gabriel who is God, but that the Father and the Son together happen to be Allah, the God of Muhammad, the greater I, God. Yeah. Before I get to that, I just want to make sure what Jesus meant that he had to go away for the Spirit to come, because mm -hmm. many Christians do stumble on that point. Jesus already told us in John fourteen seventeen the Comforter was there with the disciples. The difference is that Jesus has to go for the Comforter, the Spirit, to indwell them. As long as he was on earth, the Comforter was present with them in the person of Christ. But Christ had to go in order for the Spirit to now indwell them and empower them the way he did when Christ was on earth. In fact, this is clearly stated in the same Gospel of John, John 1, 32 to 33, John chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, and John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39, basically confirm that at Jesus' baptism, the Spirit came down upon Christ in the form of, of a dove and remained on him and would remain on him until he was glorified. And until that moment, the Spirit would not be given to anyone else. John clearly says that in John 7, 39. The Spirit would be given later, but would not be given up to that time until Christ was glorified. So that's what Jesus means. The Spirit is with you. The Comforter is with you. He's present with you in the person of Christ. But Christ must be glorified, must go away for the Spirit to now indwell them. So he wasn't denying that the Comforter was there. He was simply saying, He will not indwell you until I finish my work that the Father sent me to do. So that's his meaning. I just want to make sure, lest Christians stumble, when a Muslim raises that objection, well, the Holy Spirit was already present, but the Comforter wasn't. That's not what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. The Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, was present. But Jesus' point is he has to go for the Comforter to indwell them. So now that we got that point so, out so of the, the way. the Spirit is going to come in a special way that precisely. he was not present before. And don't we see the, the Holy exactly. Spirit descending in a very special and unique way after, after this happens? Exactly, after his glorification. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in other words, if you just keep reading, this is, this, is the, this, is, this is the book of John. If you just keep reading the very next book, the book of Acts, it says what happened after all of this. Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus' followers and uh, empowers them, does all kinds of things. Very clear. There's nothing confusing about this from a Christian perspective. The confusion comes when a Muslim comes along, tries to rip a verse totally out of context. And uh, I, I have to say here, Sam, um, is it a good idea to be playing around with passages about the Holy Spirit and start uh, applying them to people like Muhammad? Definitely not. The Lord Jesus Christ warns us, and you can find this warning. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. And Mark 3, 28 to 30, Mark 3, 28 to 30, the Lord Jesus Christ quite clearly says, all sins, all blasphemies, even sins and blasphemies against the Lord Jesus Christ shall be forgiven. But the one sin, the one blasphemy that shall never be forgiven makes someone guilty of an eternal sin and therefore eternal condemnation is the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit of God. So this would be somewhere, somewhere in the same ballpark, not the exact same thing as shirk in yes. Islam, right? Yes, as, exactly. as far as you Muslims, you're trying to think, what's the worst thing you could do? This is the worst thing you could do, according, not yes. according to Sam or David, according to Jesus. The worst thing you can do is start playing around uh, with claims about the Holy Spirit. Exactly. And that's exactly what Zachar Naik does. And so Zachar Naik, according to Jesus, is one of the worst blasphemers exactly. you, could, uh, you could imagine. And okay. Now, why would we say it's blasphemous? Imagine, you are saying the Holy Spirit is Muhammad. And again, not to be unnecessarily offensive, Muhammad's life is anything but a beacon of moral virtue. Mm -hmm. To say that that one is the Holy Spirit is a great insult, mm -hmm. attack, assault, blasphemy against mm -hmm. the pure, holy spirit of the living God. And in, uh, in uh, Surah 5, Christians are condemned for saying Allah is Jesus, Jesus yeah. yeah, son of Mary, right? Yeah. And here Muslims are saying the Holy Spirit is <laughs> Muhammad. Yeah. What, 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 you, guys, yeah. you guys have some issues. Yeah. But let's go ahead and get to... The ultimate destruction. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Muslims want to claim this. You want to claim this is Muhammad, that the comforter is Muhammad? Yeah. We say we'll go ahead and give you that for argument's sake because you just proved that Muhammad is a false prophet. Mm -hmm. right? yes. So, And this is why we pointed out a moment ago the verse that I can't believe Zakir Naik even read. You, you Muslims should avoid this, avoid this verse in this passage. But let's read it again. This is... John chapter 16, same passage. John chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus talking. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, 
I will send, send him to you. Exactly. Zachary Knight quoted that. He quoted it well. Right. He quoted Jesus saying, I'm going away and I'm going to, sp- I'm the one who's going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, whom Zachary Knight is claiming is yes, Muhammad. Definitely. So, according to Islam, Sam, who sends Muhammad? Okay. In Islam, we are told, as, as, and you can show, show this from the Quran, Allah sent Muhammad in the name of Allah the authority of Allah to glorify Allah. Allah sent Muhammad in Allah's name, in the name of Allah, with Allah's authority to glorify Allah. You just read a passage that says that the Lord Jesus Christ sends the Comforter. Not only that, if you go to John 14, 26, this is what, same, same mm-hmm. promise, John 14, 26, it says, but the Helper or Comforter, the Holy Spirit, see here, John 14, 26, he's clearly said to be the Holy Spirit. But be that as it may, for argument's sake, let's say, it's Muhammad, God forbid such uh, blasphemy. Whom the Father will send in my name. So now notice, it's the Father and the Son together that send the Comforter in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, this is John 15, 26. When the Helper, Counselor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he'll bear witness about me. So now notice, Father and Son together, Send the comforter from the presence of the Father himself who's in heaven. From the presence of the Father himself in heaven. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, how do I know glorify Christ? Because John 16, 14, he says, he will glorify me. Mm-hmm. Okay? So notice, the comforter sent by the Father and the Son in the name of Jesus to glorify Jesus. But wait, Muhammad is the comforter. Mm-hmm. But Muhammad was sent by Allah in the name of Allah to glorify Allah. Okay, so now let's connect the dots. Comforter is Muhammad. Father and Son send the Comforter. Allah sends Muhammad. Conclusion is, Father and Son are Allah, the God of Muhammad. And there's no way around this, right? You can't. because you can't. The... So, so, so keep in mind, right? You have Muhammad, right? You Muslims. You Muslims believe. Here's Muhammad. He's sent by Allah, right? So here's Allah. Allah is in heaven. He sends Muhammad. You Muhammad, go, go preach. So there's Allah and there's Muhammad. <laughs> but wait a minute. According to the Gospel of John... You have the comforter who's sent by father and son. Father and son send the comforter. Now, no problem so far, but now you Muslims, instead of saying, oh, that's just corruption, that's nonsense, you want to say Muhammad is the comforter. Well, if Muhammad is the comforter, Muhammad is sent by Allah, comforter is sent by Allah, I mean, by by the father and son, then father and son, according to Zakir Naik, is the God of Muhammad. Is the God of Muhammad. And that actually, you know what also proves? It proves the Quran has been corrupted. Why? Because in the Quran it says Allah is a father to no one and Jesus mm-hmm. is not the son. Mm-hmm. However, if Muhammad is the comforter, the last thing he would deny is that the father and the son are God. Mm-hmm. No way the historical Muhammad could have said Allah is not the father and Jesus is not his son if he's the comforter. Because the comforter surely knows it's the father and son who sent him. Mm-hmm. So Zachariah has proved that after Muhammad died, Muslims came and corrupted the Quran to omit every single reference to Allah being the Father and Son. Shame on you Muslims for perverting the message of the Comforter. So we can thank Zakir Naik once again for proving that Muhammad cannot possibly be a prophet. There's no way to make sense of these passages that people like Zakir Naik are trying to apply to Muhammad. So uh, just to wrap things up, Zakir Naik, one of Islam's most popular apologists of all time, and if we go by sheer numbers, number of people he's influenced, he may be the most popular of all time, right? Exactly. Because in the past, there were much smaller numbers of people, but now there are tons of Muslims who look up to Zakir Naik. Zakir Naik, your greatest apologist, has appealed to four passages. According to the first one, Deuteronomy 18, we saw, if we read it in context, Muhammad turns out to be a false prophet who would have been stoned to death by Moses. According to the next one in the book of Isaiah, Muhammad is this person who says, I can't read. In context, this is condemning the person for being a rebel against God. Jesus even quotes the same passage to apply to people who were rebellious against God. Song of Solomon, we saw that if you actually take Zucker's argument seriously, you have to conclude that Allah is a mouse and that God will disgrace Muhammad. This is just taking his argument one step further and applying it to various passages. And finally, if Muhammad is the comforter of John chapters 14 to 16, then we see that Muhammad must be Gabriel, that Muhammad must also be God because he has God's attributes, and that Jesus and the Father are Muhammad's God, and that the Quran must have been 
corrupted. This is what happens if you do the slightest examination, critical examination of Zucker Nike's arguments, but you Muslims, you won't do it. You just won't do it. And when you hear us exposing it, you'll call us liars, you'll call us haters, you'll call us uh, uh, sinners, you'll call us rebels, you'll call us everything. Why does your religion force you to do this? Why doesn't your religion allow you to examine these passages and to say, wait a minute, Zakir Naik can't be right about what he's saying. These passages can't possibly be talking about Muhammad. If they are, then Muhammad's a false prophet. But wait a minute, Muhammad said these passages are going to be there. Our greatest apologists cannot find them. What's that mean? It means that Muhammad is wrong. It means he is a false prophet because he said these passages are going to be there and the, ones that, the only passages our greatest apologists can find only show that he is a false prophet and cannot be speaking for God. So if we put these things together, you Muslims should be recognizing as one of the most obvious facts imaginable that Muhammad cannot be a true prophet. We invite you to seek another, another messenger of God. And uh, we invite you to read the New Testament and to join us on future episodes of Jesus or Muhammad, where we examine these and other issues. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.